you said that you can't ask young people to believe in democratic capitalism if it's not working for them. Mm. I think there's a lot of truth in that. I've tried to say it in other ways as well, that that you can understand why a lot of young people in the West are a bit disillusioned. The trouble is that they're looking in all the wrong places, I think, for the answers. But what did you mean by that? Well, I was asked at an event here in Australia, in Melbourne, um, Glenn from the CIS was interviewing me and he said, you know, the, the numbers are, that, you know, 20% of Australians don't think democracy is a good idea. Thirty. You gave me all these numbers. And I, I, was, I was amazed that it was that low. I, yeah, well, I think that's conservative. I've heard much higher figures. Right. So for young people in particular, if you think about uh, the the deal that I think about in our societies, the deal is that if you work hard and you are talented and determined and driven and if you do all the right things, then you will be able to do the things that human beings have always wanted to do, which is start a family, have your own place, uh, raise your children, uh, and be comfortable, effectively. That's what the average person, I think, seeks. That's what we all seek. Now, the best way to, to do that is to, how, how does a, a normal person save money? Well, for most people, the ability to put away thousands of pounds every month is just not on the table. Most people are, you know, it's very difficult, uh, even on a two-person Yep. household salary uh, to, to actually be able to save any money. The only way that you really can is you buy a property, you pay off the mortgage, and then you've got an asset. Well, that is increasingly unavailable to people both in this country and in the UK and increasingly even in America. Um, and what does that mean? Well, it means that you've got young people living four to a shared apartment, uh, unable to I mean, who's going to, you, you know, I, I hear a lot of conservatives sometimes talking about, oh, they need, you know, look at our birth rate. We've got to encourage people to have children. And I agree. We've absolutely got to encourage people to have children, not only because of some abstract birth rate, but it's also because it changes how you think, as you well know, and it gives you a stake in your own society. The antidote to selfishness, bringing a little one into the world? The, an, the antidote to, to not only to selfishness, but also to nihilism. It gives you a purpose and a reason to think that the future of your society matters because it's not you that's going to be living in it. It's this beautiful creature that is completely helpless and powerless that you've brought into the world that you are responsible for. Now, if we agree that that is essential and people, it's essential that people are able to do that if they so choose, we have created the conditions that have made it as difficult as possible for people to do that. Mm. Uh, and so... Um, you know, and it, we we know that the figures. I think eighty something percent of women say that they they would have more children if they could, more than zero or more than they currently have, but they are being restricted from that. So um, the material circumstances of people's lives are not conducive to them believing that the way we run things is good. Look, I think there's a lot in what you're saying, but let's tackle one issue. You're talking about the need for more kids, a lot of young people think that's the world's problem. Um, you know, too many people, it's threatening the planet. It's, uh, you know, you don't want to bring children into this mess. Uh, how does that... Be? But it's because you've got cause and effect reversed. The reason young people are nihilistic is because they don't have a future. And when you don't have a future, then you become nihilistic and you start buying into all this climate catastrophe, disaster nonsense. And then you are sort of in that space. But most I, the polling shows that, as I said, young women want to have kids. They just don't have the ability to do so. So um, I, 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 I think this nihilism comes from people's material circumstances. Uh, and if we change their material circumstances, th th their entire experience will be different. And then they will say and think different things too. Because uh, in many parts of the world, you've got a depopulation bomb going off right now. Absolutely. China being the leading example, but there are many other countries with it. Including all Western countries. Africa and the Middle East, the only countries still expanding. Yeah. And in this country, I would suggest that very high levels of immigration, our leaders are not being honest. They're not saying uh, that one of the reasons is that Australian-born young people are not having enough children of their own. So you bring in lots of immigrants, but there's no housing. So the young people who are here, whether they're of immigrant stock or not, don't have kids. So you have to bring in more immigrants, and it's a vicious cycle all the way down, unless you break the cycle by building enough houses and giving the people who are already here an opportunity to start a family and be able to afford to raise kids. Why don't we start there? 
you know. And by the way, you know, this is one of the reasons that I, I kind of talk on conservative leaning platforms about this because, you know, conservatives tend to be older towards the boomer generation who, you know, boomers get a lot of criticisms. But on this issue, I have to say your generation has kind of pulled up the draw, drawbridge a little bit. Uh, are you suggesting as a boomer I might have something to answer for? Well, <laughs> I, I think, look, a lot of us spend a lot of time talking about how young people are naive and stupid and they believe this and they believe that, which is true. But we also got to look at what they're facing. They, We've talked about the housing issue. They're also facing the fact that not only they, but probably now their grandchildren are going to be paying for the money that we've been spending on our quality of life. Less of a problem in Australia, but still a big problem. 55% jet to DP ratio. In America, it's 100%, and likewise in the UK. We're doing crazy things. I mean, interest repayments in the UK on our national debt are one of the largest items of expenditure. It's the fastest growing in Australia, too. And and we have a real... This is madness. Yeah. You're being incredibly kind, because I know how blunt you can be. In that, I, I, I detect that sort of you boomers have got a few things to ask for, and I agree with you. Oh. I'm going to be really careful here, because... I know many of my listeners will say, come on, John, we've worked hard all our lives, stop this business. You have saying it's our fault. Yeah. My line is quite different. I'm not after that. I'm not, you know, I, I believe in prosperity. I believe in people having a go and building a lifestyle. That's not the problem. I'm a mid baby boom. I'll tell you where I am highly critical of my own generation in two broad areas. Mm. The first is the one you touched on debt. I was part of a reforming government. We got rid of debt. We left money in the bank. That's the best youth policy you can have. Mm hmm. To avoid intergenerational theft. I'm staggered at what has happened in England. I don't know whether young Brits realise what a bomb they're being left. Your tax rates are high and than they've ever been. They're climbing higher than ever. Your unfunded liabilities like pensions going forward are off the charts. And here's my criticism of boomers. We had our hands on the levers of power when we should have been doing good policy. So that's not your average voter who wasn't didn't have their levers on, although it's reflected in the way they voted. Mm. It's the fact that after the great financial crisis, the reality is that instead of what doing what we did, and now I'm sounding you know, positive about the government I was part of, and paying down the debt and ending the intergenerational debt, they went for soft options. They went looking for inflation deliberately rather than paying down debt, rather than imposing tough decisions on people. And that drove up equity prices and land prices, part of the reason why young people are having a tough. The other reason I'm down on my generation is we let the idiocy get away at our university. Oh. It was our fault. Why were we not pushing back? Go to America, the greatest generation. They're all gone now. But if you go back to when I was about your age in the mid-90s, late 90s, a roughly half the academy in America was to the centre or the right or the centre and to the left. That's not true anymore. The long march through the institutions. And my point here is that what they've done to young people is give them a completely distorted view of reality. So they reach out for the very solutions that will make the problems they're worried about worse. This is what Orwell meant when he said, he who controls the past controls the future. Yeah. By rewriting history and destroying people's ability to think about the history in a contextualized way, uh, they've ruined the minds of a lot of two maybe three generations now but what you're talking about in terms of the first point you made is that i think i i imagine you'd agree with me we, we it's weak leadership we don't have leaders who are prepared to say i know you don't like hearing this but it is the truth and if we do not have leaders who are prepared to do that we will keep making terrible decisions because it's easy lying and uh, appeasing and pretending and taking the easy route. It's easy, but in the long run, it builds up tremendous costs. And that's what we are now seeing. And we need leaders who are prepared to stand up and say, I know that this is going to hurt now, but we cannot continue to spend our grandchildren's inheritance. We can't do this. It's immoral, among other things. But at the first principle, it's immoral. And secondly, the practical consequences are going to be terrible for everybody. So we need better leaders. 
we need we need leadership who you know i said this the other day when uh, uh, i was kindly invited to parliament house somebody asked me you know leadership we need leaders to put it very bluntly john to strap on a pair that's what we need and by the way i think this attitude that we've got to pander to the people and tell them only pleasantries that they would like to hear i think it's incredibly disrespectful to the average person who has a lot more sense than many of the people in the media and in the political class. Most people understand because they have to run a household and put up with the fact that their resources are limited, that you can't spend money you don't have forever. They understand that if someone says, look, we've had a difficult month this month, you know, I, I wasn't working quite as much, we haven't made quite as much, we had a, a household bill come through, whatever. We don't quite have the opportunity to go out for a meal this month or next week or whatever. Most people get this. And if politicians were willing to be honest with the public, I actually think they would get a lot more support than they think they would. I really, really do. I agree with that. You made a very interesting comment earlier about the, you know, um, skepticism being useful in public life, cynicism being caressed. Oh,